How's everybody doing? Good. I'm just waiting for a second to, for something to pop up behind me there, and then we'll get going. But I just want you to know I've uh, enjoyed uh, being with you all this weekend and hope the information that we shared um, this has been a blessing. Friday night we destroyed the fairy tale of Darwinian evolution and explained why it's scientifically impossible to take place. Um, yesterday morning we looked at the Christian heritage which has been erased in our country largely due to Darwinian uh, teachings and their foundation of millions of years of time. Last night we took out millions of years of time and explained radiometric dating, carbon dating, the Ice Age, Pangea, and all these things, and showed how they only fit a world that has endured a, a global flood. And this morning, we, we took out dinosaurs and recaptured those for the glory of God as well. But right now, I want to talk about some science and the Bible. Because the Bible tells us, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. So let's take a look at what I call science and the Bible. Now realize, first of all, that I'm not saying the Bible is a science book. It's not. It's the true history book of the universe. But where it makes statements that can be historically or scientifically um, verified, if it's the Word of God, it should hold up just fine, and it does, word for word and cover to cover. There are just dozens and dozens of tidbits in the Bible that we're told that Humans, we call this science, finally caught up with sometimes as much as 3,000 years later. For instance, in Job, we're told that light scatters the wind. And it was 2,800 years later before we discovered that light is instrumental in the causation of wind. You know, the Bible contains more than 80 verses about the need for cleanliness to prevent the spread of illnesses. These were written over 3,000 years before we knew about germs. In fact, it was following the rules of Leviticus that finally ended the great European plagues in the 13 and 1400s that killed millions of people. The Bible talks about God sitting on the circle of the earth. Well, sure enough, 2,000 years later, we found out that the earth is indeed spherical. And on and on we can go. But one of the things that we hear today, because humanists own the system, is that science and the Bible are at odds with one another. Have you ever heard something along those lines? Nothing could be further from the truth. Real science has always been a believer's true friend and always will be. And when I talk about real science, I'm talking about knowledge derived from the observation, study, and testing of existing evidence. Something has to be testable, observable, and repeatable for the knowledge gained from that to be scientific. And that's what we call operational science. That's real science, a believer's best friend. I was speaking at a public high school in Oregon a couple years ago, and I walked up to the podium. The kids came into the auditorium, and they were just cross-armed glaring at me. Now, that really caught me a bit off guard, I'll admit. I'm used to that in college campuses, and it takes a minute or two to straighten out a college campus, but it kind of took me off guard with the high school kids being that indoctrinated, and God just gave this to me, and I, I said, hey, before I start, I want to ask all of you, out of the 200 or so branches of modern science, how many of those do you think were started by Christians? None. Try over 82%. How many of you didn't know that? I bet 99%. 82% of the branches of modern science were started by Christians to study God's creation. There wouldn't be science without Christianity. You can't set out to study random chance. Isaac Newton, the greatest uh, scientist of all time, Louis Pasteur, on and on it goes. 82% of the branches of science started by Christians to study God's creation. We thought, hey, there's an intelligent creator out there, so he probably put some rules and laws in place to govern the creation. And if we would study the creation, they call it nature today, we could discover some of those things and put them into practice in our lives. That is what led to operational real science and has led to penicillin, to space shuttles, and everything in between. And real science is a believer's true friend. Always has been, always will be. This Nobel Prize winning astrophysicist stated, the best data we have are exactly what I would have predicted if I had nothing to go on but the five books of Moses. There is no reason not to read God's word and believe God's word, word for word and cover to cover. 
Now, the Bible is the only book in the history of the world that lives on its ability to correctly predict the future. About 1,700 prophecies have been made that have already come true. 1,700 for 1,700. Now, every religious text and even science books make predictions. We can call those prophecies. And maybe in, in most religious texts, one out of five come true and four out of five don't. The Bible is about 1,700 for 1,700. In fact, God even tells us the way you know it's the true word of God is the prophecies will come true. So that's how you tell the word of God from any false teaching. One of the great prophecies in the New Testament given to us about 2,000 years ago is found in 2 Peter 3, where we're told there will come in the last days scoffers. Anybody see a scoffer? Wow, there's a few of them out there today, right? Fulfilling biblical prophecy, by the way. And it goes on. These scoffers are going to claim all things continue as they were from the beginning. Well, that's a process today known as uniformity. If you want a big word, uniformitarianism. It just means things are uniform. In other words, processes we observe today, they claim have always been pretty much the same. They've been uniform. That's the way they'll look at the Colorado River and measure the amount of sediment coming out of the canyon in the Colorado River. And assuming it's always been the same, uniformity, they look at the size of the canyon and they extrapolate backwards and say it took the river millions of years to dig out Grand Canyon. How many of you have been to Grand Canyon? Yeah, I lead tours to Grand Canyon. I can turn that teaching upside down in 60 seconds at Grand Canyon and recapture for the glory of God. Uh, we'll probably talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but uniformity is one of the keys the scoffers are going to claim in the last days. And that brings us to historical science. When I speak on a college campus, I explain the difference between operational science and historical science. And the scoffers in the crowd always go, we've never heard of historical science. And I say, yes, I told you I'm going to show you things they won't tell you here because it undermines their worldview. Historical science is not knowledge derived from the study of evidence. Historical science are assumptions derived by applying operational science, things you can test, study, and observe today, to unobservable events of the past, like taking the sediment coming out of the Colorado River out of Grand Canyon. You can measure the amount of sediment today. That's operational science. But to say it's always been the same in the past is historical science. So that's how they get, and when they're, they're off on these assumptions, like with Grand Canyon, they can be off by millions and millions of years of time. You ever see a, 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 someone drain the oil out of a car? You know, they pull that little plug out of the bottom and boosh, the oil pours in the pan below. Let's say you've never seen that and you believe in uniform processes. Let's say you come along six hours later and you see this full pan of oil and you observe one drop every five hours. Well, based on uniformity, you're going to believe it took 45,000 years to fill that pan with oil, and you'll be absolutely wrong. That's historical science, where there's conflict between the Bible and science, supposedly, is historical science, not operational science. Real science is a believer's best friend. So the bias in historical science, which is almost always uniformity, just as the Word of God predicted, corrupt the non-observed assumptions of historical science, leading to controversy. No wonder in 1 Timothy we're told, avoid oppositions of science, falsely so-called, which some professing have erred, concerning the faith. That word science means knowledge. Watch out for false knowledge, especially that knowledge masquerading as historical or scientific facts. Make sure it's real knowledge that you're listening to. For instance, how did the universe begin? Well, the Bible covers that in the first five words. In the beginning, God created. Well, let's go to new scientists and see what the humanists teach. And they say, in the beginning, trying to copy the Bible, which is never a bad idea, by the way. In the beginning, and this is hard to grasp, their words, not mine, but the universe may have made itself. Well, let's talk about that for just a moment because that's actually logically and scientifically impossible. Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity holds that the universe 
is a big result. And it had a beginning cause. Well, cause and effect of logic holds that for any result that had a beginning cause, like the universe, the cause of the universe cannot be a part of the universe. In other words, simple logic holds that the cause of the universe had to exist before the universe's space, matter, and time. The universe could not have made itself. Of all ancient religious texts, only the biblical God claimed to be eternal, from everlasting to everlasting without a beginning cause, and only the biblical God claimed to not be a part of the universe. All other religions or gods are part of the universe. Only the biblical God claimed to not be a part of the universe's space, matter, and time. So logic, cause and effect, supports that the biblical God is the only logical creator of the universe. Well, a fair question is who or what made God? Well, let's go back to logic. Being eternal, without a beginning cause, places only the biblical God outside of the laws of cause and effect. This leaves only the biblical God as the only logical creator of the universe. Real science and real logic is a believer's best friend. But what about the laws of physics? What do the laws of physics support? Well, at the end of his creation, God looked at his creation, called it very good, and at the end of the sixth day, declared the heavens and the earth were finished. So God created, called it good, and, and declared creation was done. Well, the first law of thermodynamics is the law of conservation of mass and energy, that matter and our energy cannot be created or destroyed. Matter uh, can turn to energy, energy can turn to matter, but the entire amount of matter and energy in the entire universe is set. I think when God said the creation was finished, I think what he actually meant was that the creation was finished. What does science have to say about this? From Science Magazine, they interviewed Stephen Hawking shortly before he passed away, and Stephen Hawking said that there was absolutely nothing before the Big Bang. Absolutely nothing. Well, going back to the first law, matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed, holds that if there had ever been a time in the past when there was nothing, there would be nothing today. Nothing cannot make anything. That's a scientific fact. So they needed a saving device for the current Big Bang. Uh, that brings us to the singularity. And by the way, please don't come up to me and say, God could have used the Big Bang because I'm going to look at you and say, really, which one? We're on our fourth Big Bang theory. They've all been debunked, including the current one. There was the steady state Big Bang, there was a hesitation model Big Bang, there was the oscillating Big Bang, now we're on the expanding Big Bang. The cover story of the 2011 Scientific American was they need to get rid of the current Big Bang because it's got so many holes they can never fix it, but they can get rid of it. Because the only place to go from there is in the beginning God created and they don't want to go there. So let's talk about the singularity. They needed something to save the current Big Bang because nothing cannot produce anything. So they have to have a singularity that exploded and became everything. So the singularity holds that all the matter in the universe, all the matter and energy in the entire universe, not just the matter to make this building, not just the energy and matter to make the earth, but the entire universe's matter and energy was squished together into a tiny dot about the size of a period at the end of a sentence. That makes a lot of sense, right? Anyways, that's the singularity. And it exploded. Well, I'll get in trouble if I say exploded. It expanded rapidly, which sounds a lot like an explosion to me, but that's where the energy and matter supposedly came from to save the current Big Bang. Well, let's go back to science and see what Stephen Hawking has to say. The laws of physics cease to function inside of the singularity. In other words, it goes against the laws of physics, but they're going to teach it anyways, because again, the only other viable answer, or I should say the only viable answer is, in the beginning, God created. A letter signed by dozens of physicists in New Scientist magazine, titled Bucking the Big Bang, 
had statements that included the Big Bang Theory can boast no predictions that have been validated by observation, by real science of believer's best friend. And the theory relies on a growing number of never seen entities like the singularity, dark matter, inflation, etc., and can't survive without these fudge factors. They went on a state and no other branch of science would this nonsense be accepted. Hmm. The biggest scientific breakthrough supposedly announced headlines around the globe in 2016 was the discovery of inflation supporting the Big Bang Theory. And it quietly disappeared in 2017. And when interviewed, the supposed discoverers admitted, well, we never actually found any proof of it, but we wanted to believe it so bad, we just said we did. Mind-boggling. Beware of science, falsely so-called. In Hebrews, we're told that the earth and the heavens will perish. They're going to wax old. They're going to wear out, lose energy, and erode away, waste away. That brings us to the second law of thermodynamics known as the law of entropy, that things tend toward disorder, they lose energy, and they wear out. Real science, a believer's best friend. By the way, the second law, the law of entropy, is the most accepted law in every branch of science, except <laughs> evolutionary biology, which teaches things are getting bigger and better. We'll talk about that in a couple of moments. But back to the second law, things get worse and worse. The Big Bang claims nothing got better and better, evolving into living systems, genetic information, molecular motors, complexity, intelligence. In real science, never has any of that been observed coming about on its own in nature. How many times? Zero. Hmm. The Big Bang makes no logical and no scientific sense. The Big Bang is Sacralist's attempt to explain the universe without God. If you've been saying God could have used the Big Bang, well, God could have done anything. But drop that and just start reading God's Word and put your trust in what he tells us. Hey, how in the world did life begin? Well, again, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created. Let's go to an NAU textbook used in a course attacking me and biblical creation. I spoke there so many times... One biology teacher quit her job and became a Christian and got a job teaching science in a Christian school. And one radical anti-Christian professor whose dad was a Bible college professor went off to college, got convinced the earth was billions of years old, putting death before Adam and lost his faith. He's now an outspoken anti-Christian. Uh, he told me face to face, I've misled hundreds of Christian kids and I'll mislead hundreds more. I said, you said it correctly. You mislead them. You lie to them. You know you're lying to them. And he started this accredited course attacking me in creation. For their final exam, they made fun of me for an hour and a half. Is that the maturity level in colleges today? Oh, yeah, on a good day. Yeah. Anyways, they wouldn't let me come in and, and speak in the class. I would have been glad to taken on all of his objections. But in that class, they used the book written by this rural outspoken atheist, so you know who her bias is, who, and she's the president of the National Center of Science Education. So I thought, well, let's go to the president of the National Center of Science Education's modern textbook to see how she explains the start of life without God. And on page 26, it says, the origin of life was a continuum of events with a lot of iffy stuff in the middle. That's the modern college explanation of how life started without God. Well, what about uh, real science, a believer's best friend? Well, let's go to the book of Jeremiah. You know, the, the Bible, again, the only book to live on its ability to correctly predict the future. Now, this was given to the ancient Israelites, but they were told people would turn their back on God, saying to a stone, thou hast brought me forth. Well, we're too scientifically sound and technologically in, uh, superior today to let anyone tell us we came from a stone, right? I mean, you would never let anyone tell you you came from a stone, right? You'd certainly never let them teach that to your children and grandchildren, right? Well, let's go to the modern college textbook and let's see what kids are being taught. Kids, Earth is thought, believed, to form four and a half billion years ago. That's historical science, by the way. And the Earth started, scientists theorize, i.e. believe, 
as a big ball of hot rock and oceans formed as it rained on the stone for millions of years and poof, here you are. <laughs> they are teaching you came from a wet stone, a wet rock. I have atheists come up to me and get right in my face. So you believe you're invisible, God created the world. I just look them back in the eye and say, you think we came from a wet rock. You should try it, you'll like the result. They will stutter backwards and they will regroup and say, you're making fun of our position. We don't believe that. I say, hey, wait, I, I don't mean to make fun of your position at all. I just don't think you really have thought your position out very well. But you believe in the Big Bang. And they'll say, right, don't get into which one or the fact they've all been, to, been debunked. Just say you believe in the Big Bang, right? They'll say yes. So, you, so billions of years later, a big rock formed, right? Yeah. And it rained on the rock for millions of years, right? Yeah. Okay, you're sitting there with this wet, sterile rock. Where do you think we came from? And they will hesitate and think about it and go, wow, I do believe we came from a wet rock. And you have just prepared the soil to plant the seed. Because all of a sudden it has just dawned on them that they have been fooled into believing one of the most ridiculous fairy tales in the history of the world. And now the soil is ready to plant the seed. What about real science? You know, a believer's best friend. In real science, biology has the law of Biogenesis, that life only comes from life. Non-life cannot produce life. Non-living matter cannot come to life. The law of biogenesis, life only comes from life. So if you have this wet, sterile rock with no life on it, there's no way to get life started. Period. Real science, a believer's best friend. Leaving sacralists with the iffy stuff. But what about biology and the Bible? This atheist stated biology is a study of complex things that appear to be a, designed for a purpose. I mean, they admit it. Sure, likes it. it looks like these things were designed for a purpose, but they just don't believe that. They think if you start out with the raw material to form life, that life could just poof, come along on its own, given two things, time, the magic ingredient, and a source of energy. Well, we can't even get life to start from non-life in laboratories with billions of dollars in lab equipment thrown in. So life's just too far complex. But let's say we just started with the raw material to form a brick building, just some brick and some mortar. Well, they believe uh, time and a source of energy, great complex structures will, will come about on their own. So to give them time, we take them a billion years. And for energy, we, hold, we haul the brick and mortar up to the top of a five-story building. And then once per second for a billion years, we push off the brick and mortar. How many beautiful brick structures do we get in a billion years? Absolutely nothing. You get this every single time. That's what random chance will give you. You take that same brick and mortar, throw in some simple human intelligence, and you'll get a beautiful structure every single time. See, the difference between our intelligent biblical designer and random chance is immense. There's no comparison. Moses uh, wrote through the Holy Spirit in Genesis that God created every living creature. We well, guys probably know bees are needed to pollinate flowers. Well, the surface of the bucket orchid is very slimy. It's very slippery. So when a bee lands on the surface of that, that petal, it slips and falls into that bucket below. Well, in the bottom of the bucket is a pool of slimy liquid. So the bee falls in there and splat, lands right in that little pool of liquid. Well, there's only one way out, and that's a tunnel that goes to the side of the flower. So he swims around, approaches the tunnel. There's even a step at the edge of the pool, so he can climb up the step and go through the tunnel to escape. Well, as he's crawling through the tunnel, the walls of the flower contract and capture the bee and hold it there while the, while the flower glues two pollen sacks to his back. And the flower holds the bee until the glue has dried. Well, once the glue is dried, the flower lets the bee go, and he crawls on out and flies off. Now, when he lands on the surface of another bucket orchid, he goes through the whole process again. He slips, falls, splat into the pool, swims over to the step, climbs up the step, and goes through the tunnel leading to the outside. But now the walls of the tunnel cl collapse and capture the poor little bee again. He's probably thinking, deja vu, I was just here a minute ago. <laughs> but this time, two hooks come out of, the out of the flower and remove the pollen sacs. 
completing the pollination process. Please explain to me how that evolved over millions of years of time. It had to be there instantly from the start or the flowers would not have continued. That's proof of our intelligent biblical designer. In Genesis, we're told God created every winged fowl. Woodpeckers can peck as fast as a machine gun can shoot. Well, the first time a woodpecker pecked a solid log, what kept his head from exploding? Well, because the sudden stop creates uh, energy that is hundreds of times the force of gravity. Well, he was designed with a, with a tiny muscle that pulls his little bird brain away from the beak just as fast as he pecks, as fast as a machine gun can shoot. And if any shot gets through that, he is designed with a spongy bone that absorbs any extra shock. Talk about awesome biblical design. That had to be there before the first peck, or that would have been the end of the woodpecker. No wonder in Romans we're told the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, so that they that do not believe will stand before their creator with no excuse whatsoever. What about Darwinian macroevolution and the Bible? The, again, back to Romans 1, professing to be wise, they became fools. Now, it doesn't mean they're stupid. It just means they, they've been fooled. We can all be fooled. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God, which I think today is his creation, into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. I think they're going to change creation into the fairy tale of Darwinian evolution that lets you think you're the most evolved, you're your own God. We call that humanism today. And they own the system and they teach their religious belief in the place of science. That's where science and the Bible are at odds. Not real science, historical science. These verses are talking about idolatry. And the highest form of idolatry, once again, is to think you're the most evolved, you're your own God. Let's talk about micro and macro evolution. If you understand the difference between these two, you could debate a Darwinist anywhere in the world, from the local high school to Harvard, Stanford, or um, Oxford, or anywhere in between. Darwinian evolution is macro change, macro evolution. And it requires massive amounts of new and beneficial genetic information being added to a gene pool to change, let's say, a dog into a whale, which is almost what they teach in schools today. As of an hour ago, there's never been a single example of Darwinian macroevolution found to have taken place that will hold up to scrutiny. And I covered this Friday night in our top 10 Darwinian lies in the textbooks. What about macroevolution, or excuse me, microevolution? Microevolution is the only thing ever observed, and it's observed in every such experiment on these issues. Microevolution is best called microadaptations or microvariations. Best get the word evolution out of there, because Darwinists will show you microevolution and switch the discussion to Darwinian macro and fool kids by the millions into thinking Darwinism's true when actually there's never been an example found. Micro change, micro adaptations and variations are caused by the sorting or loss of the parent's gene pool. Macro needs massive amounts of new and beneficial genetic information added to cause things to get better and better against the law of entropy, by the way. Micro is caused by the loss of information as things get worse and worse, and that's the only thing real science, a believer's best friend, has ever seen. So I talked this morning about the dogs on Noah's Ark. You didn't have to take all 350 pairs, uh, one pair with the full canine gene pool, and then they brought forth after their kind by the loss of information. That's microadaptation or microevolution or micro variation. It's like saying I stepped out on the front porch, front deck, front patio. It's all the same thing. So it's a scientific fact that micro takes place, and it just means kinds only bring forth after their kind. It's the only thing real science has ever seen. Why is it vital for Christians to understand that the only thing real science has ever observed is that kinds only bring forth after their kind? Why is that vital? 
because ten times in the book of Genesis we're told plants or animals will bring forth after their kind. And the only thing science has ever observed is that plants or animals will only bring forth after their kind, with micro changes due to the loss of information taking place. So kids are given lots of examples of biblically correct micro change, but then they're led to think in terms of Darwinian macro change and are misled not by the millions, by the billions. We're losing 90% of Christian children by the age of 20, and they list Darwinian evolution as the number one reason. And the number two reason is the church having no answers. We've got the answers. There's the answer right there. But this answer gets blocked because of old earth beliefs that have inundated the church today, putting death before Adam. Sad. Micro changes, again, are caused by the sorting or loss of the starting functional genetic information. Gene pools get weaker and weaker. It's known as genetic depletion, gene depletion. And this is how I show people how to destroy Darwinism in four seconds flat. Start your watch. Gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism impossible. Stop your watch. Oh, I'm sorry, that was just three seconds flat. That's the reason they've never found an example of Darwinian macroevolution. It never happened. It's a scientific impossibility. Gene depletion, things get weaker and weaker. If they went unchecked, they would corrupt the gene pool and everything would go extinct in less than 1,500 years. But they lose too much information, they die off. Now we call that natural selection. That's really a misnomer. There's no such thing as natural selection. There's no selector standing there. It's really God's quality assurance program. Things lose too much information, and so they don't corrupt the gene pool, they die off. It's God's quality assurance program, and it makes Darwinism a scientific impossibility, which is why they've never had an example found of it having taken place. So if we look at operational science, a believer's true friend in, in uh, biology and Darwinism, we see that the law of biogenesis holds that Darwinism never could have even started. The law of entropy holds things get worse and worse, just like micro change reveals. And no one has ever seen Darwinian, anything Darwinian macro evolve, and the reason for that is gene depletion plus God's QA program makes Darwinism a scientific impossibility. This uh, world-renowned philosopher stated, posterity will marvel that so flimsy and dubious an hypothesis could have been accepted. He's saying the future generations are going to look at us and think, how stupid were those people? How could they believe in, in something that doesn't have a single shred of evidence that ever took place? Now, if you go to the textbooks, so you see lots of nice drawings in the biology books. Go to any biology book, up to the PhD level of biology, and look at the proofs for Darwinism. They are always drawings. There's an old saying that goes like this, Darwinists are experts at drawing things that never existed to support their theory that never took place. Yeah, you take away their box of crayons, they've got nothing. But they own the system, and they show kids biblically correct micro change caused by the loss of information and switch the discussion to macro change that needs massive amounts of new information added, and kids are fooled by the millions. And we would win this debate if we would get in it. We would win this debate in 60 minutes or less if we would just take it on. Well, what about geology in the Bible? Is Earth really billions of years old? Well, again, back to 2 Peter 3. Those scoffers claiming uniformity are going to be willingly ignorant that by the word of God, they're going to choose to ignore that by the word of God, the world that was being overflowed with water perished. Why in the world would you deny the global flood? Well, you see, secular geology is based on the belief that the earth's crust, those stratified layers laid down by water, their belief is based on this never having been laid down by a global flood. They say those layers form slowly and uniformly over millions of years of time, not quickly during a global flood. Secular geology is based on two beliefs, uniformity and no global flood, just like the Word of God said would take place in the last days. God told us this 2,000 years ago. 
And over the last 150 to 200 years, secular geology has become locked into two beliefs, uniform processes and no global flood, just like the Word of God says. You see, the old earth beliefs, as I showed last night, are based on how the earth's crust form slowly over millions of years of time or quickly during a global flood. So they have to deny the flood. According to the geologic column, which is that drawing of sediments made 200 years ago, it's where radiometric dating techniques get their ages from, the, the column. According to it, salt crystals formed 250 million years ago. But we find salt crystals today that have living bacteria trapped inside of them. How, how could they be a, a quarter of a billion years old? Someone sent me this package of rock salt on the label. It says, according to the column, it's 250 million years old. At the bottom, it, it says it expired last month. <laughs> Crushing defeat. I was so looking forward to having some of it. But the Bible tells us that all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered by water. Is there any evidence to support the global flood? Well, as I said in the Sunday school hour, if the word of God were true, the evidence of a global flood would be overwhelming. There should be nothing to even talk about or argue about it with all honesty. I would expect the outer crust of the earth to be made up of sedimentary layers of rock stratified out by grain size, weight, and density by the moving water. You seen a miner with a pan, he scoops up some sediments and water, sloshes it back and forth, and the moving water separates the sediments in his pan by grain size, weight, and density. Gold being the densest falls to the bottom. Well, on a global scale during that year-long flood, the first 150 days as the fountains of the deep were erupting would have eroded the top mile and a half to two miles of the Earth's original surface. And then over that first 150 days, those waters rolling around with the sediments would have separated the sediments by grain size, weight, and density. And over the second 150-day period of the flood, as they, the waters abated, they start laying those sediments back down. But they wouldn't just, just be one big brown conglomerate which you'd expect to find if they'd formed over billions and millions of years. No, they'd be separated by grain size, weight, and density. So you have all shale layered together, a whole limestone layered together, all sandstone layered together. And those layers quickly laid down in that flood would be full of billions of dead things that were drowned and buried before they could rot away or get eaten by scavengers. I mean, if the word of God were true, it'd be obvious. So what do we find today? The, Outer crust of the earth that we live on averages a mile deep of sedimentary layers laid down by water, stratified out by grain size, weight, and density. So you have all shale layers, all sandstone layers, etc. And those layers quickly lay down in that year-long flood are full of billions of dead things that were drowned and buried so quickly they didn't have time to rot away or get eaten by scavengers. Mind-boggling. So I was speaking at a church in California a couple months ago. And I drove over there, and I was driving away from my house about three or four miles down the road. Someone ran over a skunk in the middle of the road. Squished it, deader than a doornail. I came back four days later. Scavengers had already taken it off and eaten it. I was so disappointed. I thought it was going to lay there for millions of years, waiting for strata to build up around so it would become a fossil. Things have to be buried immediately to become fossils. Awesome proof of the truth of God's word. People say to me, I've never seen any proof of the global flood. I say, really? Look down by your feet. You're living on a mile deep uh, proof of the flood with all those stratified layers. You know, trilobites are found in the lowest layers with preciable fossils. So we're told they were one of the first things to have evolved. Didn't trilobites live at the bottom of the ocean? Wouldn't they be the first things buried? So, of course, they'd be in the lower layer. You know, trilobites have the greatest, the most complex eye design ever discovered. A double lens system with up to 15,000 lens surfaces. That was the first thing to have evolved? <laughs> really? No, they lived at the bottom. Of course, they're the first things buried. Proof of our intelligent biblical designer. We find geologic compression events around the world where entire mountain ranges, finely stratified layers laid down by water, are squished together like an accordion with up to 160 degree bends in the rock. How do you bend rock like this without breaking it? The layers are folded but not broken. They were still mud at the end of the global flood. And when the continental drift took place quickly and they came to a stop, they folded up like one car rear-ending another. 
Now, there is a secular excuse for this, by the way. I want you to be aware of this so they don't fool you. They'll say, well, the reason they folded was the whole mountain range was subducted 10 miles below the surface, and when it got superheated, and when they burped it back up to the surface, that's when the folding took place. Well, there's a problem with that. You see, the, if you uh, superheat sedimentary rock so it can fold, it turns to metamorphic rock. But this is not metamorphic rock, it's sedimentary rock, and that shoots down the best excuse they have. Polystrata fossils are found that traverse multiple strata layers like this tree fossil. We find uh, petro, petro, or polystrata fish fossils, all kinds of fossils. Some of the trees are upside down. Well, we're supposed to believe a tree stood balanced upside down for millions of years waiting for strata to build up around it? That doesn't make any sense. They were laid down quickly in the global flood. And why does the global flood matter? Well, because God tells us he gave us a perfect creation, a perfect creation with no death, no suffering in it. Have you ever had someone ask you, how can there be a loving God in a world full of death and suffering? You know, one of the first things a good scoffer, especially in college, will come up to a young Christian and say, hey, you know, I might like to be a Christian myself. Maybe you can help me become a Christian. Uh, well, uh, how can I help you, professor? Well, you Christians believe in this loving God that cares and loves all of us, right? That's right knows the numbers of hairs on your head, which I never thought was that big of a deal, to be honest with you, but <laughs> yes, that, that's our loving God. Well, then here's my question for you. My aunt's dying of cancer. Three kids were killed in a car accident in that intersection last night. We have wars, death, cancers, diseases all over the world. Grow up. Where is your loving God? And if that child doesn't know how to biblically answer that question, they'll probably be one of the 90% that lose their faith by the next morning. If you leave here with nothing today, and after this weekend of my being here, know how to biblically answer that question. The answer is so simple, it'll bowl you over. It's been lost because of old earth beliefs. You'll see that in a second. Here's the biblical answer. How can there be a loving God in this world for death and suffering? The answer is simply this. God didn't give us the world the way it is today, full of death and suffering. God gave us a perfect creation. Well, what in the world happened to it? Adam's first sin. Adam's original sin brought on the curse. It's known as the fall of man, allowing death to enter God's perfect world. And that's why we live in a world full of death today, yet we have a loving Christian God. How loving is that God? Well, think about this. The answer, that's the answer, but it should go further. That original sin separated us from God. Adam walked in the garden with God. Why don't we walk in the garden with God today? Sin has separated us from God. Well, this required that we be redeemed with God. But we have a problem. We have to be 100% righteous, sinless our whole life to be redeemed with God. And we are all born with a sin nature. We're all sinners. We cannot redeem ourselves with God. Be honest with yourself. Have you ever said something that wasn't true? That makes you a liar. When you stand before a righteous God, you're going to be found guilty. Have you ever taken something that didn't belong to you, even a sticky note or a paper clip? Well, that makes you a thief. When you stand before a righteous God, you're going to be found guilty. Pastor, we've only discussed this 15 seconds. I think everyone here has admitted they're a bunch of lying thieves. So, so we've got a problem, right? We can't redeem ourselves with God. How loving is God? Despite our sin that corrupted his creation, he sent his only begotten son to suffer and die on a cross, his shed blood, covering our sins so we can be redeemed with our righteous creator for eternity in heaven. And the only way to the Father is through the shed blood of the Son, and the way we receive that is we simply put our faith in Jesus Christ. And when I say that, the, I mean the Jesus Christ, the one and only found in the Word of God. No other. Put your trust in the Word of God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, when you accept an old earth belief... No matter how well-intentioned you think it is, that puts death before Adam. Did I mention Satan's really good at what he does? 
You see, once you believe millions of years of death existed before man, and someone asks you, how can there be a loving God in this world full of death and suffering, you can't answer that question. If you believe death brought man into the world, you can't say man's sin brought death into the world. You see that? Separating us from God, requiring our redemption through Jesus Christ. I would beg you and plead with you, drop the man-made beliefs that are trying to fit the foundation of secular atheistic humanism into God's word. Realize the global flood wipes out every old earth belief by explaining how the layers form quickly. Put your trust in the non-compromised word of God. The word that became flesh and dwelt among us. In fact, Jesus said, if I have told you of earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? What's Jesus saying? He's saying, if I have told you of earthly things that you can test, study, and observe, and you won't even believe those things, how are you going to believe in spiritual things that you can't test, study, and observe? The calling of our ministry is to show that real science is a believer's true friend and to assure folks that God's word is true, word for word and cover to cover. So you can put your trust in the word who became flesh and dwelt among us our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, we uh, do this for our various uh, teachings and messages. If Darwinism is a problem for you, we've got, we crush that in one simple teaching and in my book, Cost. We have our DVDs out there, five DVD sets. I don't copyright my DVDs or my thumb drives. You can make all the copies of our information that you want. My book, Cost, is out there, Creation, Original Sin, Separation, and the Cross. It covers the top 10 Old Earth beliefs, Top 10 evil fruit of these beliefs, because Jesus said you tell good from bad by the fruit. The top 10 Darwinian beliefs and the top 10 proofs of creation. There's a study guide at the end of each chapter. We also have uh, coloring books on Noah's Ark and dinosaurs and our Christian heritage, since uh, that's been stolen from our children today. Northwest Christian School is in Phoenix, and they are one of only 17 Christian schools in the entire world to receive what's called exemplary accreditation status. What does that mean? It means when a kid takes one of their courses and gets credit, if they switch to a public high school, they can use their, the Northwest Christian School credits for electric credits toward public high school graduation. Well, two years ago, two and a half years ago, Northwest came to me and said, hey, Russ, we see the way things are going, so we're going to put together an online school that we want to launch in August of 2022. That's next month. And that way, anybody in the world can take our courses, and public school kids can take our courses that will qualify for public high school graduation credits. And they said, Russ, would you uh, be interested in putting together a, a teaching on creation, an 18-week semester-long course? And I said, I'd be honored to do that. And I worked with Northwest for almost two years, and we built an 18-week course. It's going to take about 85 hours of work. It's a full course, and it's built on my book cost. also incorporates all of my videos in there and more. And it's called Creation Science in a Biblical Worldview. It'll launch next month, and anybody in the world can take it, and any public high school student can take it and earn credit towards graduation. It's the first time the Bible and creation has been in our public schools in 60 years. If you know anyone with kids in public school, I mean, anyone can take it, homeschool, Christian school, but if you know anyone with high schoolers in public school, take down my website, creationministries.org, send that to them, tell them to go to that site, and on the left-hand menu, the second one down says high school course, if they click there, it'll take them to the page that has links to the uh, Northwest School's description and the registration page. We're losing 90% of our kids listing Darwinian evolution as the number one reason. Here's the answer right there. Please, if you care at all about these kids, get some information to them. We also have a, a, a thumb drive that only has four teachings on it. I let people make copies of my DVDs and thumb drives. I have no problem with that. I encourage you to do it. But the problem with the five DVD set is there's so much information on there. If you give it to a scoffer or a skeptic or a compromising Christian, they won't, may not know which one to watch first, and they might watch the wrong one. These are the four teachings in the order I would give anybody, a secular professor, a compromising Christian, an atheist, anyone, and it will make a big impact 
on them, starting with the top 10 Darwinian lies, ending with the top 20 skeptical questions and answers. We have uh, thumb drives out there, uh, the one with the four teachings. We have another one that has over 800 items. Uh, I won't go into that. You can see that out there and, and talk uh, with Laura out there at the book table if you're interested. But when we look at science in the Bible, I'll end with this. I think what we really find is operational science should be defined as knowledge derived not from the uh, study of evidence, but from the study of God's creation. Sir Francis Bacon, Christian and known as the father of the scientific method, stated, a little science estranges a man from God, but a little more will bring him back. Put your trust in the Word of God and realize that true science is a believer's true friend, word for word and cover to cover. Let me end my part with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning and every dear soul that's here. Thank you for the uh, Pastor Rick, Pastor Larry, and the staff here and their willingness to stand on your non-compromised word, word for word and cover to cover. And it's in the name of my Lord and Savior, the word that became flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus Christ, that I do pray. Amen. God bless you guys.